The man, the myth, the mullet. We've got Eric Van Hals on today. I am so excited to talk to you. Uh, you and I know each other pretty well. I've interviewed you before, but you have some exciting news that we're going to talk about today. But to just get started, can you tell the audience a little bit about Beard Brand, about the mission, and how it was really started? Yeah, Beard Brand, a uh, men's grooming company. Obviously, Beard is in our name. We sell some amazing beard care products, but we've uh, grown beyond the beard over the years. We've got some shampoo, conditioner, sea salt spray, uh, utility bar, which is like a versatile bar soap you can use on your hair, your beard, and even to shave. I uh, got a mustache wax, beard oil. We, we've really like grown mm -hmm. uh, a full line of men's grooming products from head to toe. And uh, primarily done that through our store on Shopify. We launched on Shopify back in 2013. So I feel like we're one of the older stores out there. Uh, <laughs> they've really done a, an amazing job to, to grow over the years. And, and really, we haven't thought twice about the platform. And um, yeah, it's just been grinding, grinding for a number of years. And we've been able to get into Target. So we have some uh, retail that we established uh, before, uh, but we just, uh, I think it was like August 1st or something, September 1st, just launched a, a brand new barbershop. So uh, we're dipping yeah. our toes into to bricks and mortar as well. So we'll see, see if that was a bad decision or not in a few months. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go out on a limb and say it was a great decision, but we'll get into the strategy behind it. Um, originally, you guys were a D2C brand, so very online, one-to-one -one with your consumer. And D2C has kind of been reigned as like the new way to sell. And even there's been, at the beginning of the era, a lot of brands saying like, retail is basically the enemy. We're not going to go into retail. It's all about this digital channel and the one-on-one -on -one connection. But like you said, you guys are going into the physical space nonetheless uh, in the middle of a pandemic, which is awesome and a crazy story that you guys have got there. Um, was it always the plan to open a barbershop? Was it always in your idea that someday you would go into retail? Or was it kind of a new decision based on the brand growing and the times changing and all that? Yeah, we, we've kind of got like a pretty unique situation probably different than most companies out there in the sense that we have a YouTube channel with like one and a half million subscribers that is primarily barbershop cuts. So half of the reason is for us to control the production of our filming on our YouTube channel. But it's also mm -hmm. in today's world, we we're, we don't sell on Amazon. We're kind of anti Amazon. And, and you think about what are all the things that Amazon can do well? Well, they can have tons of selection um, they can have like a low price and they can have like quick shipping, but they're never going to be able to do like experiential type of things. And for, for a number of years, I've wanted to, to do that. It's like, how can we further enhance our customers' experiences and, you know, giving them what they see on YouTube, uh, the barbershop experience is, is one of those, uh, functions. So it's been a number of years that I've wanted to do this, but the challenge with, retail and specifically barbershops is it's about the people it's about the talent it's about the barbers and you can't uh, barbers aren't you know like beard oils on an assembly line you can't just you get one barber and they're exactly <laughs> the same all over you've got to to really foster a culture that attracts the like-minded barbers who who are talented as well as represent our core value so it's a very challenging um uh, a very challenging thing to uh, to embark <laughs> upon and, and barbers are artists, you know, so they, they also like, um, they're a little free spirited and you kind of have to have that kind of that vibe to be able to mesh with them, which I think we have at Beard Brand. Yeah. And, and the cool thing about Beard Brand, um, I mean, for one, you, you just took like my biggest punchline. I was like, oh, we got to talk about YouTube and I was going to drop your subscriber number, oh, sorry. Uh, which is 1.6 million as of today. Uh, just so you can give yourself an extra pat on the back. Um, but speaking to the barbers, I think that's really interesting. And, and with a lot of brick and mortar store owners, finding the right staff is difficult and also really important, especially when you're trying to create an experience, which I think now more than ever, like if someone's going to take the like inherent risk to walk into your store or your physical space, they are kind of taking a risk. So you want to give them a really good experience. What is it, you know, about those people that you look for, especially compared to kind of your, I know what your brand core mission is, but the audience doesn't. So if you want to kind of lay those out and then talk about what you look for in, you know, 
the retail opportunity or hiring Bob or the way you go about your YouTube videos, how do those kind of core values come around to make this this retail space what it is? Yeah, so uh, really interesting. Um, Bob is uh, kind of like the barber who's leading up the stuff. And um, he had this kind of pathway from uh, uh, us working with him just to film and to get on a channel at a different barbershop to uh, him wanting to kind of work independently out of our studio for a period of time while he waited for a school to open up and he was going to take over that barbering school uh, to COVID coming and hitting where that was no longer an option. And then us being able to have that option to, to pick up the lease in our other building, we decided to sign that lease and kind of give Bob the freedom to, to build out the, the barbershop. But because it's a YouTube channel, uh, because we have like products, um, we're able to build it in a way that is maybe we subsidize it if, uh, you know, we have bad months or something like that. So it's less of like this profit driven, uh, type of, of channel for us and more of like, you know, one giving us control over our, um, you know, production capabilities and being able to turn off the music and shoot the way we want to shoot or shoot <laughs> the times we want to shoot or bring in the barbers we want to bring without, you know, yeah. like asking other shops, which was a problem we were running into. And then, um, also like being able to have all of our products there. Like, so if people want to come by the beard brand office and smell all the different products or get the, like the full beard brand experience. So we've, we've, we've got our core values of freedom, hunger, and trust. And, um, Bob's really kind of free. And then we've, we've also done the, the same thing with like our relationship with the barbers is, uh, really in, in barbering, you have two options. They can kind of rent a chair or you can pay them a salary plus a commission or whatever. Um, where it comes into like the freedom side of things, uh, for us, it made sense that they would rent the chair and really own that relationship with their customers. So we're not taking any uh, commission off of, you know, any uh, things that they're doing or any relationships they've built, like all their, the money that they get from the cuts comes into them and then they, they're able to rent the chair. So I think they've got a lot, um, higher opportunity to um, earn. And then we let them like set the prices too. Like this is your relationship with your customer. And if you, yeah. if you feel you're worth something, and then it's part of that is going to be educating our customers to let them know that, Hey, barbers aren't, they're not widgets, you know, like every barber is different <laughs> and you yeah. can't, you can't commoditize, you know, a human being. And I feel like so many barbershops are trying to do that. Whereas we want to mm -hmm. celebrate the uniqueness of our barbers and what kind of different skills they have. Um, and then allow them the, the freedom and, and, uh, to set their own prices, set their own style, set their own work. And then, uh, you know, of course, hunger did that drive to really serve a customer and, I don't know, man. It's it's pretty exciting. It's pretty exciting. We <laughs> we wanted to do this for a number of years, so we'll see how. It yeah, turns out. has it been? Uh, has the initial kind of wave of it been super fun? Has it been overly stressful? Have you had any like massive revelations or learnings that have kind of come out of it? Well, I'll tell you, I'm very lucky that uh, I've got an amazing team. We we've been talking about a team <laughs> a lot in here, and and our team really does live up to our core values. So I handed over the reins to uh, Sylvester. Sylvester, and he's just kind of been managing that relationship with the barbers. Um, and like, he's into style, he's into the language. He was actually wanting to be a barber at a period of time in his life. <laughs> so, uh, you know, like, I don't know, like the world just kind of, everything seems to fall, fall into place, uh, when you need it to fall in place. You know, what you're saying with the barbers is so cool that you're allowing them to one, like live by the core values of freedom, hunger, and trust. And they're able to succeed as well, which then brings more customers in because it, it feels good for everybody. And that also means that those barbers are representing the beard brand brand and they are extensions of your brand. So then the question becomes at some point, like we have to go into the conversation about conversion here. How do you start to bridge the gap between this experience and your actual products that the barbers may or may not be using while they're doing these cuts? Yeah, you know, part of part of cutting out of the beard brand barbershop is that, you know, we've got all the beard brand products there and, and we kind of control um, what they carry. Um, we, we have a policy, like if there's something that beard brand doesn't make that we feel like will accent their, you know, workflow production or something, they mm -hmm. can buy it. And if they want to sell it, they can, they can sell it as well. So we're not going to stop them doing that. If it is a direct competing product to, to beard brand, we... We won't allow that, but uh, I think it helps because it gives us, you know, inspiration to, to create new products that hopefully we can, you know, fill out the line for anything that that's not 
uh, in there that they need compared to like our online store is very modest, but it is yeah. fun to see the opportunity there. And also fun to like, from a market research perspective, understand how barbers interact with their customers and what the potential is. Like if we have an average barbers doing this per month, then if we bring on, you know, a barber shop, we can expect them to move that kind of products and, and really get a gauge of like what the marketing opportunity is. Um, so there's a lot of, you know, really good benefits to it for like the bigger picture as we grow and expand. That's actually something I, I was curious about with, with your YouTube channel and with bringing in these barbers, you guys invest so much in your own employees and your own customers but you have this very intense dedication to kind of just the barber community in general. Is that something that you you did on purpose? Is there a strategy behind that that actually informs the brand, informs the way you're growing? Or or is that just kind of coming out of a, a place of passion? Yeah, I mean, uh, again, a lot of things just, you know, luck seems to find us when we, we work hard. <laughs> so the, the whole barbering thing started from, uh, when I did a trip out to uh, London to meet up with Carlos, uh, one of our team members, and uh, you were always looking Infamous. for Carlos. Mm -hmm. He is just a he's a beautiful specimen of a human being. Yeah, if you, if you ever want to feel insecure about you know anything, <laughs> <laughs> just look at Carlos, and, yeah. and he'll he'll check all the boxes for that. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're always looking for ideas for content, and it's easy to get burnt out, you know, creating content on YouTube. So we're like, let's let's just film our ourselves getting haircuts. And um, so we go, I film Carlos and Carlos filmed me and we broke it up into like <laughs> four videos, like a haircut, a beard trim, and then him, a haircut and beard trim. Uh, we learned that it should have been two videos, but you know, hindsight's 2020. <laughs> we threw them up on uh, YouTube and those ended up being our best performing videos. And we're like, oh shit, wow. you know, like we've got something here, so let's do it. So he reached out to the barbershop again. He's like, Hey man, can I just film you? And so Carlos started just filming stuff and, and we were able to get to, to get the traction from there. And I knew nothing about barbering. Like I couldn't tell you the difference between like a, a <laughs> mullet and a fade or a taper and you know, all these things that I've learned over the years Yeah. Uh, or like a, a good haircut. I couldn't even tell you the difference between a good haircut and a bad haircut. <laughs> uh, it took me four years to convince my husband who has like more beautiful hair than I do. Like he just has a mane of thick, gorgeous hair. It took me like four years of dating him to convince him to go anywhere, but super cuts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I, I think a lot of guys are that way, you know, and I, you yeah. know, my personal journey with, with barbering was I would go to super cuts and I would always walk away with a haircut that I hated always. And I'm like, why am I paying, <laughs> you know, 10 bucks or 15 bucks for this? Like, I'm just going to get my own clippers and brr you know, <laughs> shave it down to one guard or two guard and then just do that every every couple of weeks. And I did that for a long period of time, you know, where it was like the difference between me cutting at home on the same length guard and going to supercuts was pretty much the same. And then yeah, like yeah. getting into the the channel, you really do realize the difference between a good barber who can do like a, a fade and you're like, wow, that haircut looks amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and you just look so much doper uh, with like you spending 20 bucks more for a haircut. And yeah, I mean, for me, I can't I can't go back. Yeah. Uh, you touched on something that, that I wanted to ask about, which was um, how much content you guys put out. And I think for a merchant who, you know, for brick and mortar owners right now who have started in brick and mortar, they are being kind of pushed into omni channel and e-commerce and they're having to start to enter these channels that for a lot of them probably never even thought that they would have to do it. And now it's almost a, like a make or break moment for a lot of these retailers and content marketing. I would assume for a lot of these people is like, like what content, what, like what, what are you even talking about? How do I take my store and start to create content for some channel, whether it's email or social or YouTube or Instagram or anything like that? How do you even start to come up with those ideas? I don't know. I, I think, um, bricks and mortar um, businesses are at a distinct advantage. You know, like so many uh, online stores, like if you look at their offices, they're either like out of a warehouse and they're fulfilling themselves and it's like the, the nastiest part of town. There's like no visual appeal at all. Or, yeah. you know, they got some like B-class office probably. It's probably not like a really cool environment. And then like all all their their products are just like displayed in boxes on shelves, right? You know, like there's, yeah. there's, 
there's no like glamour at all. Whereas if you're yeah. a, a bricks and mortar, like you've already got the scene established and like you can film like after hours or before hours on the weekend or, or whenever your downtime is and like, you know, get people immersed into your brand and into your company and to like what you guys are about. And then you can just like grab things off the shelves and kind of tell stories around that. So I think there's a lot of really cool opportunities you can have from a creative uh, standpoint from a content standpoint that really like just direct it to, to consumer companies they don't have, you know, they have to, to manufacture yeah. it every time. And, you know, creating good content's always going to be challenging. And, you know, for, for us, it's always looking at the metrics and the data and understand what's resonating with our audience and trying to, to do more of what resonates. How do you go about testing content and figuring out what does resonate especially when they they don't have established audiences. Their audiences are brand new to the brand on a new digital channel. Yeah, you know, it, it's really kind of interesting. I would imagine if you're a longtime bricks and mortar retail person, like, and I see it too, like there's a lot of restaurants I go to or a lot of places I visit and I'll look at their online presence and it's just terrible, right? There's, there's no thought <laughs> yeah. put into it. You know, it's like random stuff on Instagram. Like I, I you almost have to like, in my opinion, build a, an online presence, build a, a digital presence, not targeting your customers in your local market, but targeting mm -hmm. the lifestyle of the people who would be attracted to your brand globally. Yeah. yeah. And uh, when you start to think that way, when you start to have like a little bit bigger picture, it, then your mind will open up a little bit more to the type of creative you can bring in that really will resonate with the type of person around the world. If you're in Atlanta or if you're in LA or if you're in New York or in Austin, when people come to visit that town, they're like, oh, I wanna go to the Beard Brand Barbershop and get a haircut there yeah. when I'm in town. So you wanna kind of like cater towards this this um, um, global audience while, while still staying true to your, your local audience and like really showing the local, what what's so awesome about your local environment that the world would, would love. You know, I think it's great advice because it is easy to think, you know, if you're a Colorado Springs local merchant, you think your target market is just the Colorado Springs population and people who are walking by. Yes, there may be some tourism coming in, but that's kind of it. And with the pandemic has shifted that a little bit where one local traffic is far down. And so you can't really depend on that. Two, you're forced into e-commerce. So even though it feels probably really overwhelming for a lot of people, it is also opening the horizons and, and opening your reach to who you can actually talk to. And then almost, I love this idea of thinking of your store as not just kind of your home base or your only place your brand lives, but now it almost becomes like, an extension of what your entire brand can become. So thinking through, you know, what is the future of my brick and mortar store? It, it actually becomes like a destination for the brand. Like what you're saying, um, beard brand, the barbershop is really a destination of the brand. Um, I was going through your Instagram announcement today and it was crazy to see how many comments were actually from people who were not even in Texas, they were like, oh, we're gonna have to make a trip or like, oh, next time that I'm in Austin, I'm definitely coming by. And to see that as a, a very real example that even though you're local, you can go very wide and it works together in this really like uh, harmonious way because you're learning from your local people and you're learning about the best kind of customer, but then that allows you now to go beyond those people and actually reach a lot of other people. So you have people seeking out your store rather than just kind of walking by and there's a cool sign out front. Well, well, what I, what I want to describe it as is you become an accessible celebrity to people mm. who are passionate about what you're passionate about. So people who are yeah. really passionate about grooming, like beard brand can become that Mecca for them. Like where if they really want to be like super engaged, they come down to the beard brand barbershop, they get to meet all the YouTube personalities they've been watching for years. Like I, so there's a, a, a coffee company that I'm super jazzed about lately. It's called Onyx coffee lab and uh, they're out of Arkansas. And it's like, if I ever do a, a road trip, like back out East, I'm like, I'm going to find their location. Cause they've got a coffee shop <laughs> and I want to go in there yeah. and I just want to like, you know, like try all the different coffees and meet the people behind it. And, you know, hopefully I won't be, you know, disappointed in their bunch of like assholes or something like that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just love everything about what they're doing in terms of, they're another Shopify 
um, Shopify store as well that uh, um, they, they, their, their store is just amazing. It's just beautiful. So again, like um, companies are doing it, you know, like companies are bridging that gap between online and offline. And, um, you know, I think it's really exciting, you know, because um, I don't know, like the, the first time you ever get recognized in person from the content you've created is just like a really <laughs> warming, warming feeling. Yeah, I bet. I'm I'm waiting for that day. It'll happen one day. Someone randomly will just pull me into their store and be like, I know you. Or, you know, the, the <laughs> problem with like podcasts is like they got to know your voice. So you just got to be talking right? all over the place. Yeah, I'll just start walking around with like a megaphone talking about myself. <laughs> talking about retail, um, like look I, what so, this retail is doing. <laughs> So I, I want to do a little, um, I called it on my internal doc, a ban holes challenge, which you just set me up perfectly for. Uh, I think this is what happens when two podcasters talk is we just, we just tee each other up perfectly for our next questions. Um, which is, you mentioned it, when you start with e-commerce, you have this advantage. Um, and we've talked about different advantages and different advantages either way different disadvantages either way. Um, and one big one with e-commerce is that you already have all this data on your customers. So like you're saying, you're able to go in and segment your customers and say, okay, we actually know who lives in Austin. So we can kind of target them with this messaging. We know who has bought this many products. Uh, we know who's like watched this video on a beard trim and has bought a comb and has maybe texted in asking for some styling advice. So you have all that you can start of, you can kind of start to play with with the retail channel and kind of feeding it in. But for people who are going the opposite way, there is a disadvantage there that you don't have that. So you're going to have to kind of build it up through testing channels and doing all the work that all these, you know, D2C brands have already done. So so my challenge is for you is to flip your script and say, okay, pretend that Beard Brand actually started as a barbership. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Tip my words today. <laughs> that would be pretty cool. Like a giant boat with a bunch of barbers on oh. it. Barbership. I like it. So let's say you actually started Beard Brand as a single barber shop. How would you have actually entered into the digital space? What would you be testing first? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it. there's a lot of similarities. So there, there's products that you'd be carrying in, in the barber shop, and there's actually like a, a whole industry designed to support barbers kind of developing their own products. But I, I think it is like really telling that story of what makes your barber shop unique? Like, what is the vibe of the mm -hmm. shop? Like, like you want to have, um, you know, like there, there's just like kind of classic independent. I I tend to think of restaurants as perfect examples, but I know they're retail as well. Like in Spokane, there's a yeah. place called uh, Atticus and Fitch, uh, Atticus and Finch, and um, they had both coffee and tea and like a little. And doodad, you know, like calendars and, and stuff like like coffee <laughs> mugs, just kind of like trinkets. Yeah. Uh, but they were really like cool, like well collected type of things. And then uh, also there's like um, Stag Provisions down in, on South Congress is this men's store that has like a really cool vibe to it, really cool culture. There's Man Ready as well, kind of in our space. And I feel like you know these these retailers are really doing some innovative things that they just they just need to amplify their voice yeah. uh, and just figure out how do we tell the stories of all the cool things that we're doing with this local audience and how do we just tell that to the world? There's certainly companies who have done that, who had their footprint yeah. uh, in bricks and mortar and made that transition. Um, but I really do think like a company like Need Supply is uh, probably an example of a company that that was a retailer apparel style and, and they took it online and, and really done a good job with the photography and, you know, the email uh, newsletters that they send out and the imagery and all that. The thing that I always want to remind people is it's easy to get hung up in all the things that the mega companies do well, right? The Amazons yeah. of the world, the Walmarts, you know, like t 20 years ago when, when I was growing up, um, they always talked about how Walmart was putting the little guy out of business. I'm like, well, well, Walmart, yeah, they do, they do great selection, great prices, but there's so many things that they don't do well. Like, you know, if yeah. I want to go in and I want to ask someone like advice on a product, like they're not going to, they're not going to do well. And like Walmart sells bikes, yeah. right? But there's bike shops everywhere uh, because bike, mm -hmm. bike people know stuff about bikes and you want that information and you want that experience. And I, I think if you're trying to invest in the Walmart 
business model of like mass selection, low price, you're going to lose. You're going to lose. Yeah. Um, so you have to you have to focus on the things that the the other players can't do and th- use that to your advantage. And once you've figured that out, then I, th- I feel like that's when you're going to find your traction. Yeah, for sure. And uh, one last thing before we kind of wrap up, there's a major part in, in the retail industry right now that is revolved around trust. Um, kind of this, you know, do I trust that this brand has taken the measures to make sure I'm safe if I go into the store because we're in a worldwide pandemic? Um, do I trust that it will be worth me going into the store? Do I trust that the experience is going to actually make me come out with something of value, even if it's not necessarily a purchase of a product? And something you guys do so well is that and it's it's in your core values what what do you think it is that you guys have done that's built that that such an extreme level of trust that even someone who said i don't trust anybody but i will trust you guys how did you even craft that relationship with your yeah, customers? i mean that goes back to you know creating content they, they can literally see the work of the barber that they're going to so they they know exactly their personality style they know how they're going to talk to them they know how they're going to communicate and they know the the, the work they're capable of uh and that is like really empowering to to know and and you know i think almost every guy and girl out there can can speak to having a bad experience with a, a barber <laughs> yeah and, you know part of it is uh, and they they don't realize that part of it's on you as the person in the chair, right? You you didn't do a good job communicating or explaining the thing mm-hmm. that you want. Your expectations weren't set. But at the same time, like uh, the barber too may may be a poor communicator. They didn't understand what you wanted or didn't have the capabilities to do it. So by providing more information to our audience, like they can literally take the videos into their barber and be like, this is exactly what I want, <laughs> this haircut. Yeah. Do you see how it is? Like do this for my head. And then a good barber will be like, well, your head is square and their head is round <laughs> and, you're, just not, and yeah. you're bald and they've got, you know, Carlos Costa style hair. You'll just be like. Yeah, yeah. So that's where like kind of the, the, the good barbers will come in and work with that type of content out there. Um, and even point their their customers be like, hey, check out the Beard Brand Barbershop channel and, and get some ideas and inspiration on cuts that may maybe you find interested. Yeah, I, I love the idea of kind of setting expectations for a customer as someone with a, a weird amount of social anxiety where if I have to go to like a restaurant I've never been to, I for sure have already looked at the menu and I've picked out what I wanted. I've looked at like the photos online so I know when I walk in like, where the bathroom is, where the bar is, because I don't want to be that person who doesn't know what's going on. And and there is this, it's a really good tip on content in general, whether you're selling candles or your barbershop or you're selling clothes, you can now start to express what that experience is going to be like. Um, a lot of people are doing, you know, virtual shopping tours or they're doing personalized shopping and you can start to actually just take that content and put it out so that you can give customers that expectation, which like you're saying, then builds trust so that the second they walk in the door, they already kind of know what vibe they're going to get, what to expect, who they're going to talk to, what it should be like. And that's automatically going to make that experience better and get them, you know, 10%, 20%, whatever, closer to walking out of your store with three or four items that, you know, maybe had you not set their expectations, they wouldn't have come in so prepared to purchase. Yeah. And it it just makes it, you know, you're just breaking down walls, you know, you're breaking down barriers and uh, just again, lubricating the transaction. Mm -hmm. The you know, everything kind of works towards that, you know, like, uh, you got to build trust. You talked about that building trust and it, it's like going on dates. Um, you guys, I mean, I'm an old guy married with kids, but it's like, <laughs> you know, it's very rare to, to like end up in, in someone's bedroom the first night, right? You got to go to a couple, yeah. couple of dinners, couple of like movie nights. You got to get to know people. You got to like build that trust and same things with shopping. You know, if it's a, a, a $2 pen that you're, you're buying maybe maybe it is a split decision but for most things like a camera you know you spend hours and hours researching and watching other reviews and learning about it so all those are opportunities to kind of build that trust with your your audience uh, the dating metaphor is my favorite metaphor for commerce in general uh which is just simply every time a customer walks into your store or shows up to your website Think about it as you're meeting them for the first time and you're trying to get them to a marriage. Yeah. Like, would you the first time you meet somebody be like, hey, 
you should go home with me. You should give me your number. We should go back right now. We should do that. Which is what a lot of experiences feel like (laughs) when shopping and it just wouldn't work. So thinking about kind of that slower, longer relationship, especially now that Omni channel is so big for brick and mortar retailers, you have the ability to, to, kind of extend that relationship and be more patient because you can collect emails and you can collect phone numbers and now you can start talking to them on these other channels because the world has forced us into all having to talk digitally. Um, I I only have two more questions for you. One of them, I'm curious, just because it's a barbershop and naturally that means there's got to be some good stories that come out of it. Do you have like a favorite barbershop moment so far? I I think just for me, like launching it was the most exciting thing. Like it's just been so many years uh, that we've wanted to do it. And we did a good bit of work in there to, to get it up and running and, you know, do it all official too. You know, I got the license and you know, mm-hmm. all this stuff that, that I, I'm glad that Sylvester did because uh, I, I don't want to do that anymore. <laughs> yeah. And, and from the customer's perspective, just that experience of like being in a beard brand barbershop and then the founder of beard brand, who is the guy you see on the Instagram, the guy you see on the ads, the guy in the YouTube video is just walking through like, Hey, what's up guys. Uh, it's such a powerful move that I know comes so naturally to you. Cause this is just who you are, but is such a cool aspect of having a retail operation is that you do get that chance to actually have those connections with customers. Um, so the last question before we sign off, this podcast is called resilient retail, as you all should know and can see if you're watching the video here, uh, what does resilience mean to you and what does it mean to beard brand? Yeah. I mean, uh, like uh, resilience is, is I feel like one of our like unspoken core values is kind of like all freedom, hunger, and trust all paired together. It's like mm-hmm. so many times, uh, especially uh, I, I made the mistake of going on the Shark Tank and kind of telling our margins. Uh, and I even watched a video of one of my competitors talk about. It. There's like, oh, there's this dude who went on Shark Tank and said his margins, and then <laughs> it's like <laughs> face palm in there and. And, uh, you know, like, uh, you know, six months later, like everyone and their mom had a beard care company. And what I said during this, this time period is just like, no one is going to care more about what we're building than we are. You know, they may, th- it, it is a great idea and they may kind of follow our good idea, but they're not going to outlast us. Like I'm going to be here. I'm not on a five-year plan. I'm not on here on a two-year plan. I'm on, I'm on like a 20-year plan and I'm building mm-hmm. this company in a way that allows me to enjoy it for the next 20 years. I'm not going to get bored. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to like, you know, let somebody else come in and that there's going to be a problem and we're going to solve it. We're going to work to solve it. And you know, maybe we don't solve it at the speed that we want to solve it. Maybe we don't grow at the rate we want to grow, but we do, you know, put one foot in front of the other foot and, um, we get better and, and you know, like we're going to outlast you, you know, we're, we're just going to outlast you and uh, we're going to make it really damn hard to compete with us. So that's just kind of like how, how I see it. Um, and I do really resonate with the word uh, resilient. It is something that I just, we've talked about a lot. It's just like, we're just going to outlast yeah. you. We're just going to do it. Personally, I dealt with infertility for like 10 years of my life and still happily married to my wife. Like yeah, I will suffer for as long as it takes. Uh, and I will, I will be better off because of it. Wow. That's the most beautiful way I wish to end an episode, but I realize I have one more question, (laughs) which is of all of the products. If somebody wants to try beard brand, what should they try first? I have my top pick, but I'm going to save it to hear yours. Well, you know, of course, uh, all my products, they're like my children they're all my babies. (laughs) I, my, my personal favorite, and it will probably surprise most people, but is our utility bar. Uh, that product took about three years for us to manufacture. We do it the old fashioned saponification way, cold with vegetable oils and, and lye. And uh, we, we press it into a round uh, shape so it's easy to hold in your hand. We we did so many formulations of it because it has to work as a hair shampoo, it has to work mm-hmm. as a beard wash, it has to work as a body wash, and it has to work as a shave soap. So like my wife is using it to shave her legs, I'm using it to shave my cheek lines, I'm using a wash, it, and it's just one bar. Like when I travel again, like that is all I need. Um, and we got them as three packs now at, at like 21 bucks. And we, they've just been, we've been, oh, cool. it's been hard to keep them on the shelf uh, since we did that. But yeah. what about you? Well, I mean, I you've used, a- I'm, I'm going to guess the sea salt spray, right? Oh, yeah, of course it's the sea salt spray. Guys, the sea salt spray is 
the best thing that I have found for my hair and my husband's hair. Uh, I style his hair now every day because he's like got a, he looks like an NHL player in the middle of playoffs, I would say is really his style right now. So it takes a lot of work. So we use the sea salt spray and the utility bomb and the beard oil all together and it works so wonderfully. But yeah, the sea salt spray is amazing because it actually has like, what are the, it's clay at the bottom. Yeah, right? yeah, so you yeah, shake it yeah. up and then it actually holds your hair and makes it texturized and makes it actually feel like you went to the beach without being like nasty. Yeah, I love so I've, it. I've got the sea salt spray and, and our styling balm in here and that's, that's all I got in there. And uh, yeah, I even use it as like an air freshener before the show. I'm like, I didn't want to spruce uh-huh. up the room a little. It smell nice. So I, I, mean, I need again, to get like you every, a every video product. of my dog reacting to the sea salt spray. Yeah, he, I remember that. He like rubs around the whole tub because he likes the way it smells so much. Yeah, that was great. That made my day. I shared it with the team. That was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for being on Resilient Retail. I am so excited about you guys' new venture into retail. We'll be sure to kind of catch up with you later, uh, maybe even bring you back to see how things are going in a couple months. Awesome. Thanks so much for having me.